From mid-January to the end of February of 2024, we took another of our snowbird adventures to escape the Ohio winter. This time we headed to Florida for warmth and sunshine. While in Florida, we spent a lot of time along the Atlantic coast, starting with our time at Gamble Rogers. We camped at the beach campground of Gamble Rogers State Park for a week. The campground was basically a parking lot right off A1A, but it was overlooking the ocean. The amazing views of the Atlantic and the sound of the waves made up for any shortcomings of the campground. We had beautiful weather the entire time and really enjoyed our stay here. James Gamble Rogers was a talented folk singer and an advocate for Florida's natural beauty. This park's name was changed to honor him after he drowned here trying to save another swimmer who was stuck in a riptide. Prior to the name change, this park was called the Flagler Beach State Recreation Area and has served many functions, including a lookout for enemy submarines and ships during World War II. The park's strategic location along the Atlantic Ocean made an important site for coastal defense efforts. The park has two sections. We were staying on the beach side, but right across the A1A is the river side. Here there's another campground, docks to fish from, and loads of hiking paths. This would be what people might refer to as a hammock, because it's a shady area. The hiking paths vary in length and difficulty, providing options for both casual strolls and more challenging treks. We opted to hike the Joe Kenner Nature Trail, which meanders through the coastal hammocks and marshes and offers opportunity to observe native plants and wildlife, including this armadillo, which was very busy and didn't even look up from his rooting as we walked by. One of the coolest experiences we had when we stayed here was watching the full moon rise over the Atlantic. We owe a huge thanks to our friends Dave and Sue for the recommendation of the Moonrise Ranger Talk. It was spectacular to see the moon rise over the ocean. With over 145 acres of wilderness, Gamble Rogers offers something for everyone. We really enjoyed our stay here, and there is nothing like being able to take a morning walk on the beach or being lulled to sleep by the sound of the waves. Right down the A1A from our campground was the town of Flagler Beach. This quaint, quirky town was quiet during the week but got lively on the weekends. Access to the beach is available from multiple parking lots near downtown and we saw a lot of people enjoying the sand and the surf. Sadly, the iconic pier was closed due to safety reasons. We were told that the plans are in place to potentially replace it with a concrete pier. Flagler Beach maintains a laid-back, relaxed atmosphere hearkening back to the bygone days of coastal vacations. The town's charming downtown area features locally owned shops, restaurants serving fresh seafood, and art galleries, contributing to its quaint and welcoming vibe. Sandwiched between Daytona Beach and St. Augustine, this little beach town is great for anyone looking for a vacation spot without the excessive crowds of some of the other more famous beach towns.
the most iconic lighthouses on the Atlantic coast is the St. Augustine Lighthouse, and we couldn't miss the opportunity to visit here. The St. Augustine Lighthouse was first lit in 1874 and has played a vital role in guiding ships through the treacherous waters of the region for 145 years. Over the years, the lighthouse has weathered storms, wars, and passage of time. In 1980, it was added to the National Register of Historic Places to preserve it for future generations. The rooms on the bottom floors of the lighthouse served as the lighthouse keeper's office, as well as storage for oil and other supplies. There are 219 steps that spiral up to the top of the lighthouse. Each landing contains displays that provide information about the lighthouse and its keepers. This was nice as it gave us an opportunity to pause and catch our breath. We both made it all the way to the top, though only one of us made it out the door. along the lighthouse gallery provided panoramic views of the surrounding area and the ocean. It was beautiful, but I have to admit, a little knee weakening. We headed back down to explore more of the ground. Even if I try to leave, you still make me want to stay. The Keeper House contains a variety of displays and exhibits that offer insights into the history, maritime heritage, and technology associated with lighthouses. It also showed the living conditions and daily life of lighthouse keepers and their families. Don't you think we've had enough of the trauma you bring? Ain't you tired of thinking we can get through it? The lower levels contain displays of maritime artifacts and information about notable shipwrecks along the coast. There was also a special exhibition about shrimping in this part of Florida. Anyway, like I was saying, shrimp is the fruit of the sea. You can barbecue it, boil it, broil it, bake it, saute it. There's uh, shrimp kebabs, there's pineapple Okay, 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 we get, we get it. We get it. <laughs> We found Lee's Lane, a nature trail through the town. We did that hike before we headed out. We visited the Castillo in St. Augustine in our hunt to visit all the NPS sites in Florida. After touring the Castillo, we had a little bit of time and decided on a quick tour of the must-see sites of the city. We figured the easiest way to do it was on a tram tour. St. Augustine is the oldest continuously inhabited city in the United States. Founded by Spanish explorers in 1565 and is often referred to as the ancient city. Over the centuries, the city has been shaped by Spanish, British, and American influences, resulting in a unique blend of cultures and architectural styles. We loved what we saw on the tour and plan on coming back in the not too distant future for a more in depth look at this beautiful and interesting city. Feel
On our last day at Campbell Rogers State Park, we drove down to Ponce de Leon Inlet to check out the lighthouse there. Originally called Mosquito Inlet, it was renamed in 1927 to entice more settlers to the area and to honor the Spanish historical figures of the region. The admission cost of the lighthouse and the exhibits was an incredibly affordable $6.95. I asked the cashier how the rates are so low, and she shared that they strive to keep the admission low so that it is accessible to everyone. They do this through the hard work of the Ponce de Leon Inlet Lighthouse Preservation Association, a totally self-sufficient organization that receives zero tax-derived support. This is one of the tallest lighthouses in the United States at 175 feet. Completed in 1887, it was built to guide ships safely through the treacherous waters of the inlet. The lighthouse has witnessed countless ships navigate the water and has weathered storms and hurricanes. In 1998, it was declared a National Historic Landmark thanks to the hard work of the Preservation Association, who took over ownership in 1972 and painstakingly worked to restore the lighthouse and the surrounding grounds. The spiral staircase that leads to the top progressively gets steeper as you go up. The last section was more ladder than stairs. In total, there are 203 steps to reach the top, I'm told. From the lighthouse gallery, you can see miles in every direction. It was beautiful. Climbing to the top of the lighthouse was an amazing experience. I just wish I would have worn more appropriate shoes as the climb down was a little sketchy in slides. <laughs> After the lighthouse, we decided to check out the exhibits in the other buildings of the museum, starting with the principal keeper's dwelling. Lots of displays describing the mechanics of lighthouses, including information regarding the Farnell lenses. The second keeper's dwelling was focused on past lighthouse keepers and their families. There were many displays showing items they used in their daily life. It was interesting to learn about the daily struggles of the lightkeeper's families. Even things like getting the kids to school or getting supplies was a major issue. Next to the path that leads to the nature walk was a small but interesting display of rafts used by Cuban refugees to come to this country. The raft display shared a story of the effects of changing policies on immigrants and refugees for this country. In the process of restoring the lighthouse, some of the members of the association committed to learn everything they could about Farnell lenses. This worked so well they became known throughout the world for their abilities and are often sought out to help with the restoration of other Farnell lenses. This has led to this amazing collection of Farnell lenses. The Farnell lens is designed to focus and direct light in a specific direction, maximizing its visibility and range. The arrangement of prisms and optical elements within the lens help to amplify and distribute the light emitted by the lighthouse lamp. 
producing a powerful and concentrated beam. I, I, you know, I almost was like, oh gosh, another lighthouse. And I love lighthouses. I really do love lighthouses. We love visiting this lighthouse and highly recommend it. One of the campgrounds we stayed at in the Atlantic area was the Tomoka State Park, which afforded us the opportunity to explore some of the areas around the intercoastal and rivers of the region. We really loved our campsite here, which felt very private due to the lush vegetation that separated each of the sites. We'd heard a lot about the Tomoka Outpost, so we hiked from our campsite to go check it out. It was a pretty long hike, but very much worth it. Here you can rent canoes or kayaks to paddle the Tomoka River, and during the warmer months they provide guided ecotourism and fishing excursions. We were hungry from our hike and decided to grab a little snack before continuing our exploration. Tomoka State Park is located on land that had been inhabited by the Tamakwa peoples for thousands of years. Evidence of their presence can be found throughout the park. As we hike, we came across the Chief Tomoki statue, which is dedicated to a prominent leader of the Tomokan tribe. The statue is a tribute to the indigenous people that lived in this area. Despite efforts to assimilate the Tamakwa into Spanish colonial society, their population continued to decline due to disease, warfare, and exploitation. By the late 17th century, many Tamakwa communities had been decimated or displaced, and their traditional lands had been taken over by European settlers. Our hike reached Tomoka Point and found the purported site of the Tamakwan village called Nakaroko. It has been noted by the Spanish explorers as the largest native settlement in Northeast Florida. There are many other state parks within a short drive of Tomoka State Park, and we took advantage of the proximity to explore. The drives around this area are some of the most beautiful that we have seen in all of Florida, and no matter how many times we drove the Ormond Scenic Loop, it never got old. Bulow Plantation Ruins Historic State Park is one of the parks we visited. It's supposed to be how big it was, maybe? Well, the white post. The white post or how The big park it preserves the ruins of the Bulow Plantation, which was a prosperous sugar plantation established in the early 19th century. At its peak, the plantation covered thousands of acres and was worked by enslaved laborers. That looks like a gator bath there. The plantation was abandoned due to the destruction caused by the Second Seminole War in the 1830s. The Seminoles, fighting to resist their forced removal from their lands, launched raids on plantations and settlements throughout the region. You can drive down to the ruins, but we chose to walk. We didn't have very high expectations of the plantation, they're just ruins anyway, but we were both a little awestruck. The park does an amazing job bringing the place back to life with informative signs and stories that take you back in time. It took a few minutes to check out the exhibits before taking the nature trail back to the parking lot.
place truly offers a unique opportunity to explore the history, culture, and natural beauty of Florida's past. And we're so glad that we took the time to visit here. Right down the street from the ruins is Bulow Creek State Park, known for the Fairchild Oak Tree. One of the largest and oldest live oak trees in Florida, it has been purported to be over 2,000 years old. But the best estimation is closer to 400 years. After checking out the tree, which really is remarkable, we decided to try and take a little hike. It was muddy, but we ended up being able to complete the hike. Walking around Flagler Beach, we came across the Betty Stelflick Memorial Preserve. The preserve encompasses 217 acres and includes a variety of coastal habitats, including salt marshes, mangrove forests, maritime hammocks, and tidal creeks. These diverse ecosystems support a wide range of plant and animal species, making the preserve an important area for biodiversity and wildlife conservation. Our friends Dave and Sue were camping at nearby Sebastian Inlet State Park and invited us over to see their campground and visit this amazing park. It is situated on a barrier island between the Atlantic Ocean and Indian River Lagoon and is renowned for its pristine beaches and consistent waves. We had an amazing time visiting and catching up with them, and we were able to get some amazing shots of wildlife. Big thanks to Dave and Sue for hosting us and feeding us. Those veggie hot dogs were very good. And sorry about running over your sign. I've never seen one before in my life. I've never seen one before. Really? Yeah. Oh, you didn't get to <laughs> yeah, I should have worn mine. If you walk down the beach, uh, there's a hero beach right there. I don't know where you came across. Yeah, I don't know where you came across. That way. And, and there's a pier. Stay in Florida, we revisited Fort Clinch. We had spent two nights here last year and loved it so much we returned to explore some more. Located on Amelia Island, the park is named after the 19th century coastal fort at the heart of the park. Last year when we visited, we stayed in the beach campground. This year we camped on the riverside. We had just finished setting up the tent when our campground host let us know that there's a lot of rain in the forecast and that our campsite will most likely get flooded. Ever the optimist, we decided to stay. The next day, we hiked out of the park. We had found a multi-use trail, so we put on our hiking boots and headed out. The hike was absolutely beautiful. Along the way, we even got to see a lighthouse from the distance. Thank you. 
Once outside the park, we hopped across the street to a restaurant to get a bite to eat. We ended up spending more time here than we anticipated and were eager to get back on the trail and head back to camp. About a third of the way back, we started to hear thunder. Luckily, we had packed our rain gear and were prepared for the downpour that came next. The rest of our stay here vacillated between mildly damp and extremely wet. Despite the weather, we tried to keep busy and keep our spirits up. We hiked around the fort, looked for dolphins in the river, and even got to see a sub heading out to the ocean. We got to spend some time with Dave, Sue, and their dog Cassie. They were kind enough to host us for dinner a couple of nights to keep us from melting in the rain. Fort Clinch is an amazing park and one of our favorites, but the weather was too much for us this week. Once we got a break in the storm, we decided to pack it up and move on to sunnier skies in Ohio. Join us next time to learn a little bit more about our thoughts and experiences at each of the campgrounds where we've stayed on this trip.